Let's pray. Let's stay standing and let's pray together this morning. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, for your grace. Lord, we thank you that we can come together here and celebrate and give praises to you. Thank you, Lord, for how you have helped us and been with us during this conference here. Thank you for all the good hospitality, particularly for Adnan and all of his hard work and for the whole committee that made this all possible. And Lord, I just pray that you would continue with us as we come towards the closing here tomorrow, that you would lead us and that you would guide us. And Lord, thank you for the freedom that people have felt on each evening, Lord, people that express their faith in their own way, and for especially for Wednesday night, how that there could be that expression from the uh, black community. And then the next night with the Hispanic overlap and, and the Asian, Lord, and all of us together can feel a, a sense of freedom that we can come together and see this reconciliation really take place. And Lord, we thank you for CC Day that you have uh, led us and guided us to this place. And Lord, help us to not to forget what you are doing and what you have done in our life. Now we pray that you would open up your word here to us today. Help us to understand it and make the proper application to our lives and to our situation today. So bless us this morning. We ask this in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. On your, on your uh, seats there, you're going to see a little pamphlet there. I would like for everyone to take one of them home with you. It's an announcement about um, uh, a book that is coming out very soon. And, uh, and it's uh, written by John Thomas, a young man who spent uh, five years working as my assistant from Haiti. He went back to Haiti. He's a great example of one relocating back to his home. And it started a revolutionary ministry there in Haiti among the poorest of the poor in Haiti. And so this is going to be a good book that we're going to be using in terms of a model in uh, God's work among the poor. This book should be coming out in the spring of this year. We're going to have a lot of them available at our next uh, CC Day conference in New Orleans. And, uh, and, and so we want you to be praying uh, for this. Uh, you might want to audit, go ahead on an audit already. And that would encourage them so much. So take one of these with you, uh, home with you, and, and, and um, so you can be ready. Okay. Let me give you a little background here as we come to our third chapter. We're going to look today at the third chapter of the book of Philippians. But well, you need a little point of reference of why we are having these Bible classes, uh, how I go about selecting the passage that we're going to use, and, um, and, and a little bit about CCDA. Uh, CCDA was born, the beginning of CCDA as we know it, and as we have tried to live it out, began really in about 1964 or 65. Uh, we had went back to Mississippi. I had been converted uh, in 1957. And three years after my conversion, I went back to Mississippi, relocated back to my home in Mississippi. And there we started a ministry. You got to know what 1960s was like. It was a, probably was the greatest upheaval that this country have ever had outside of the Civil War itself. Uh, it was a civil rights movement uh, in the South. And also it was a time of great distress and poverty in the South because mechanization and the, the share crop system was coming to an end. And we was there in Mississippi. It was in those days that the, what we call the poverty programs began. And the whole idea of a poverty program directed towards the poor had its roots in Mississippi. Uh, uh, there, uh, there, was a, there was a psychologist and a, a child psychologist and a, uh, who had went to Mississippi. He's from Harvard. Uh, can't, uh, I can't think of his name right now. Uh, Robert Cole. Cole. Dr. Robert Cole had been in Mississippi 
and he was looking at the poverty of Mississippi. And of course, the strategy that the Kennedy administration was going to take in terms of, of integration to try to change America was the fact that they was going to start integration at the elementary school level. And they thought that would be less resistant, that the little children would play together, they would get to know each other. And then as they grow together, uh, then they would go on to the high school level. And, uh, and then uh, we would have smooth integration and breaking down the racial barriers. And they had committed that. So uh, Robert Cole was in the South studying the relationship between learning deficiency and malnutrition. That there were so many people down there that were so poor and they were so malnourished. And Robert Cole came to the conclusion that if a child did not get the right nutrition, even they finally said before the child is born, and after they're born, in those first three years of their life, they would be affected for, by life in terms of their ability to learn. And so the whole idea then that he pushed the administration to start what we come to call Head Start. And the idea of Head Start, if you didn't, of those children, the Head Start program was primarily a feeding program in, in order to raise those kids' nutrition or values or whatever, so that they would have the possibility of learning once they got to the first grade in school. And so he be, they, be, they began that uh, 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 program uh, in the South. And so it was poverty. It was poverty everywhere in the South. And, and then it was at this time that CCDA was born. Uh, I was there in Mississippi. And, and the thing that really, the poverty was real. We, that's when we, out of that's gonna come health centers, out of that is gonna come development that we are talking about. But what really got me was, I did not quite understand the, the oppression of the church and how they were the stewards in maintaining segregation and discrimination and the apartheid system. It wasn't until I became friend with a, a Baptist minister, First Baptist Church, and he and I became real good friends. Uh, it, this was important because reconciliation sort of assumes equality. It, uh, really, a person who thinks they are so much sophisticated and better than another person, probably the best shots they can do is do charity and patronizing. It is only as we look at people of value and only as we look at the people that we're ministering to is having equal value that we have is that we can deal with them in a way that affirms their dignity and create the kind of motivation and incentive for their own development in society. That, that's the issue in, in, in terms of uh, helping the poor. It's how do you release the God-created dignity that's already in people. You don't give to people's dignity. I hear people say that all the time. Oh, I'm, I'm, our program is giving people dignity. Your program can't give dignity. Dignity was established by God in creation when he said in the image of God created he them. Male and female created he them. You, you understand? And it's only because we have deprived and not educated people in a way that affirm their dignity that we got them at the bottom in society. And so that's, that's the issue. And that's the issue of CC Day. And that's the, I, I'm going to talk about that more this morning. Because that's, it's going to always be a struggle uh, in terms of when people get up with mobility. The strongest force in the world really is a class force. That, 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 that there's these people who think, I mean, racism and all of that is class all wrapped up together. But I find that in my community, there's a barrier between upper class blacks and the poor. And a sophistication that is just as deadly as anything else. Because they gain all of this privilege, but they really don't do anything. They cl almost claim to be still the poor. And the responsibility of helping the poor don't become us upper class blacks. It becomes somebody else's responsibility instead of us. So that barrier is there in the community. And one of the things that I want CCDA to be is an organization that is always concerned for the poor, not just serving the poor,
but this become an organization with the poor and with any other people, middle and upper and all other classes who have a concern and feel a sense of responsibility and hear that as a part of the call of Jesus Christ on our life because Jesus' message, his first message, and I think this is his continued message, the way we value our Christian faith is about our attitude toward the poor. True religion and under fire before God, the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows and to keep oneself unspotted before the world. Yes, we want CCDA to include everybody, but we want to include everybody in the sense we want those everybody's to have that focus on the poor. We are just not here to enrich you that you might be enriched. We are here to enrich you that you might hear the message of Jesus Christ and that you might be there and stand beside and use our resources to reach out after the poor. And so we want, there's a lot of good organization that is coming online, a lot of good coalition all over the United States that are coming online. And I praise God for those good coalition, people who are working together. But we wanted CCDA to be a coalition working with the poor, for the poor, among the poor, and the people who come to serve with us, rich and the poor, would come to serve with that idea that we want to reach those people at the bottom of society. And that we not only want to reach those people, but we want to work together with those people and become one with those people. That's what we wanted CCDA to be. And so we are not trying to make CCDA some big, high, polluted, sophisticated organization. We want CCDA to be an organization that puts its interest and its concern among the people at the bottom, enriching them. We, we didn't come, as Jesus came, to be served. Jesus did not come to be served, but he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom. And we want to be the people that follows him. And that's why ministry developed out of what we call the three R's of development. The first R was that we was going to lo relocate and that we were going to live among the poor. Live among the poor. We want everybody to work with us. The upper class, the middle class, and everybody else. But when they come and want to stay there more than three weeks, we want them to come and live among our, the poor. Yes, we want them to commute in from the suburb to help tutor and to give their life away. You understand? We need that assistance. But when we talk about real development, we're talking about incarnation. We're talking about living and empowering. And not only that, but helping the young folks to come to know Jesus Christ, stay in school, get some skills, go off to college, and come back to that community so we can build a base in that neighborhood and so that we can provide some of the goods and services in our community so that we will not always just be beggars, but we would be givers. We need to look at the poor as people that we are bringing to involve them with us in carrying the gospel to the end of the world and to give them the privilege of participating in carrying this gospel to the end of the world. We got to look at the poor as people that bring value to our life and value to the mission uh, of the gospel. That's important. And so the first hour was relocation, living among the people, making the people's needs your very own as close as you can. That's important. That was Jesus' method. He came, he could have sent angels. He could have created some kind of super miracle uh, to, to take care of the poor. He could have rained down manna from heaven like he did in the wilderness to take care of the poor. But Jesus decided that he would come and that he would live among us, live among us. So they, we, if we're going to follow Jesus, then we need to go and live among the people and empower them. That's the idea of CCD, relocation. The second area was reconciliation. Reconciliation. I believe that's the essence of the gospel. I, 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 I think we might make a mistake uh, when we create a uh, reconciliation organization. It might be a mistake. It might be a mistake because it might be that we are dichotomizing the central message and putting it off onto the side and making it a sub part of the gospel. Because reconciliation, racial reconciliation, economic reconciliation, reconciliation to God and to each other is a very center piece of the gospel. You don't even understand the gospel if you don't understand the fact that the gospel is the power of God 
to reconcile Jew and Gentile, black and white, rich and poor, together into one body. The early biblical thought that you couldn't be a Christian and a bigot. That's what James tries to tell us in his book. If there are coming to your assembly a rich person, and you say, sit over here in a good place, and there are coming to your assembly a poor person, and you say, sit here on my footstool, he said, you are showing partiality. And he's saying that you don't have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. The faith of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ have no respect of a person. And so at the center of the gospel, and I hear, and I go to these reconciliation meetings, and there are side issues, and we are most uncommitted that to a certain section. We got a committee in the church that takes care of reconciliation, and they take care of that, and the other folks are taking care of other business. And so, so that's heresy. That's heresy. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and has given us collectively, the church, the ministry of reconciliation. And then he moves on even farther than that. He said, we individually, we're ambassadors for Christ as God is begging us to be reconciled to God. So reconciliation is at the centerpiece of, of, of the gospel. And if you don't believe in that, if you don't believe in reconciliation, if you don't believe that God is reconciling people here on this earth together so that they can be together throughout all eternity in heaven, you don't understand the Lord's prayer. Because he prayed that his kingdom would come, that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in heaven there is all of the races and nationalities worshiping God together in heaven. So reconciliation is at the center of the gospel and it need to be reintegrated back into this holism in our society and not isolated as a part not a calling somebody gonna say this is not my gift this is not my calling that's the way we do today we use those words to avoid being responsible you, you know we can always say that this is my, not my calling this is not my gift and God didn't call me to do this and so I don't have to be responsible uh, God want all of us to be reconcilers that's our task. That's the work of the church, is reconciling people to God and to each other across racial lines. And that we might have this oneness of purpose. And that oneness of purpose. And that should be the, the, the purpose that ought to pull us together. That ought to be the very cause itself. Because the problems in society is racial, ethnicity, and tribalism. That's where our war come from. And that we would be then authentic peacemakers if we was truly reconcilers in the world. And we, we would really be God's people. And so the third hour then was, is redistribution. Redistribution. And when I used to talk about that, people used to just flinch. When I said that, they would, they would say, they would say, because we was close to communism then. Communism idea was to take everything from the rich and, and give it to the poor. And they thought I was a communist. And I said, that's too foolish. If you would take all the money from the rich today and give it to the poor, I said, the rich would have it back tomorrow night. Because all the poor would go out and buy used Mercedes. You, you understand? And so the rich would have that money back. We're talking about something more creative than that. We're talking about how do we make res that which makes resources. Money is makeable. We make that stuff. It comes from in intelligence, it comes from ideas, it comes from education, it comes from incentives. And that's what the poor need. The poor need that, which I get people all the time, we be talking about a, a redistribution, and people be started talking about, I want my piece of the pie. I always said the pie has already been cut up, let's bake a new pie. Let's bake a bigger pie. Let's be creative, let's be creative. And so the whole idea is that we're talking about that which creates wealth in our society. Yes, I like what Mary was talking about. We're talking about assets development, and I believe in this assets development. I believe in it so powerfully. But the best assets and the most important assets we have is our children. The, most, the best assets we have is our people. Our people is our basic assets. And if you don't nurture them and develop them, you don't have no assets. You can bring on all of this money you want to bring on. And the people don't know how to utilize it in a creative way. It's just going to be waste. It's going to be like this poverty program that we've had over the years that has spent trillions of dollars in the neighborhood, 
Yes, it has enriched and made some middle-class people. Middle-class people. But as soon as those programs closed, those people left that neighborhood and that community because that community did not have the economic base to supply the income that they was getting from those poverty programs. That's why it's so important, absolutely important then, that we develop the neighborhood. Yes, again, I reject this tokenism of redistribution. And this is a popular poem we use. You've heard it since you've been here. The whole idea is uh, give people a fish and they'll eat for a day. Teach them how to fish and they'll eat for life. I said, that's a lie. Whoever owned the pond determines how long you eat fish. And so what we need to do in our society, what we're talking about, is how do we then, how do we then create, develop people so they can begin to build assets and ownership at the base level. And that's what CCDA is all about. And I see economic development is any kind of development that provides a job. Provides a job. Of course, the first thing we got to do is help people with their skills, their reading skills, their writing skills, their basic skills. But by any time, economic development is when we build a clinic. In, in Lundell community, probably the greatest economic development, we talk about the pizza reel, we talk about all those other things, we talk about the investment corporation and all of that. Uh, what is providing the most jobs in that neighborhood there is that health center. And that's economic development at its best because it's caring for the wealth, well-being of the people. And it's providing 150 jobs almost for the people in the neighborhood. And so I don't separate what we call social development. I don't separate that from economic development. As long as we provide a job and teach those people how to save and develop a credit union, a saving base, and in that neighborhood, so those resources, some of those resources can be reinvested back into the neighborhood. Okay, I got away from my teaching this morning. I got away from my teaching this morning. I really wanted us to understand uh, what CCDA is all about and what we are here to do and the mission that God has called us to here. In, 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 in the community. Let's open our Bibles now to Philippians chapter. That was my introduction. That was a pretty long introduction. Let's open our Bibles here to Philippians uh, chapter 3. And this will be our final time uh, together here uh, this morning. Now, what do we have here in Philippians? And I've told you the reason I selected Philippians. I selected Philippians so that we could look into the mind of Christ through the mind and the life of the Apostle Paul and also through those he discipled. And so we are looking at the mind of Christ so that we can have the mind of Christ. The Bible says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul had the mind of Christ and those people he discipled had the mind of Christ. You can find that in the chapter we've just finished. He talks about Timothy and he talks about Epidotus. He talks about them. And if you look at them carefully there, you can see that they had the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ, they were not concerned about their own affairs. They were concerned about the affairs of others. The reason Epidotus got there in the first place in Rome in prison with him because he came to bring an offering from this church here in Philippi. And so he was there because he was serving others. And you look through the mind of Timothy, when he need to send someone some place, he says, I have no other person with me that has the same concern that Timothy would have for you because he is the one who have the mind of Christ. And so you look at these three people here. They all have the mind of Christ. And so what we are doing is we are looking at what the mind of Christ looked like. And, of course, he centered that when he talked about in the other chapter when he said... Uh, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself of no reputation, but took upon him the form of a servant and was found in the likeness of a servant, of a man. And then he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. And yesterday we talked about walking in humility. And I'm going to talk more about that here this morning. 
because I'm afraid that we are organizing too much uh, cult personality into what we are doing. You know, and I'm so afraid that we're selling people too much on the personality. Uh, I, I think that we need to sell people on walking in humility. God resisted the proud. He gave his grace to the humble. And so we got to teach people how to walk in humility like Jesus walked here on earth in humility and like he called us fathers to instead of being just bragging about what we're doing. And much and much, we have to be very careful while we want people to absolutely know what we are doing and we want to see these models created around the country and that we want to see those kind of models like Mary uh, Nelson was talking about. But we don't want to over-exalt Mary and Mary is not going to over-exalt herself. We want to exalt what Christ is doing and what the people are doing and what the poor people have come together there in that community to do. And so we are not there just to build personality cults. We're there in the neighborhood in the community. And I don't know whether or not personality cults have long-lasting effect on people. I think personality cults come and go. And many times the people is worse off after that's over with than it was before. But if you can plant some ideals among the people and get some people in that church walking in humility, that church goes on and continues in that neighborhood. That's what we want to do in the neighborhood, in the community. And so he talked about that. We looked at the mind of Christ uh, there. Now what we want to look at here this morning, this is a very positive book. It's positive because it's a personal letter. This is the most personal of Paul's epistles to the church. Most of the other epistles Paul wrote to the churches, he, he had some reason because there was something wrong in the church that, that, that took his attention. First Corinthians and Second Corinthians was written because there was this church was in a mess. And, and, and the church, the book of Galatians was written because the people there was trying to uh, serve Christ and serve the law and they wasn't walking in grace. So most of the books that Paul wrote in the epistles he wrote, he wrote them to the church so that we could know how to discipline and encourage the church so that the Christian could grow and develop together. Uh, this epistle here was not for that purpose. This epistle here was written for Paul to thank the church that had been his number one support church. And that brought joy to his life and he brought joy to their life. So this epistle here is about joy. But even in the midst of that, Paul has a little warning. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. A little warning. And I really don't want this to be critical. I really don't want this to be critical. And I really don't want it to be to, to take on a personality. I want it to ha be factual. Here's a little warning here that Paul is going to give uh, to the church. This church that he loves so much that he's now fixing to talk to them. Listen to what he says then uh, in this book. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Now, he's, fixed, he's getting ready now to say something very, very critical here to them. He's fixing it now to warn them. You know what I'm saying? But he wants even that to be in the environment of joy. You, you know what I'm saying? He's in prison, and he's in the worst situation you could be in, and he's writing a letter about joy. So the joy of the Lord is our strength. Christian joy should be the force that drives us on along. Let me explain joy. What is joy? Joy is I have a hope, I have a dream, I have a planning, and our hard work, and then looking over our shoulder and seeing a little of it being fulfilled. That's what joy is. Joy is seeing long time expectations come to pass. Joy is when you go to the uh, hospital room and after nine months that baby is there and you've been expecting it. Joy is the fulfillment of hope and dream. That's what joy is. Joy. Joy, you know, that's, that's what happened at that first Christmas night. 
That's why we say joy to the world. Uh, the Lord has come. For unto you is born this night in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And the angels begin to sing joy to the world. Joy to the world. Joy. They had been looking for that Savior. It was fulfilled. So joy is the fulfillment of hope and dream and expectation and labor that we are striving to achieve in the community. Yes, we ought to be having dedication to building, dedication to this, dedication to that, because it's a time of us looking back and see that it has happened. And it is happening. It has happened. Our long expectation is, uh, is fulfilled. And so the Apostle Paul here is, is writing this in joy. Now he's getting ready to, to warn them, but he want to warn them in joy. Warn them in joy. He want to see that this warning is going to avoid uh, some trouble if they don't accept this warning, they're going to get the trouble of this. And so he says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. He said, I rejoice in the Lord to write this unto you. And this is no grievous thing for me, although it might sound like it's grievous to you. But you can rest for certain that it's safe. It's, it's helpful. It's helpful. And then look what he says now. This is the warning. He says, beware of, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of these people who wants to circumcise you, who worship God. Uh, we worship God in the spirit, and we rejoice in Christ the Lord. We have no confidence in the flesh. Let me explain to this, and then I'm going to try to make an application, because this is my main message this morning that I want to talk to you about here. Uh, in Paul's ministry, it was... He was, in, he was, got the understanding on the Damascus Road of the grace of God. Paul is the one who put into words the grace of God. And, and the grace of God, as Paul felt it was, here he was a murderer on his way to kill the Christian. And God, in his own love, reached down and embraced him and loved him and saved him and sent him off to the very people that he was going to kill. They was going to go to the Gentiles to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God. And, and so Paul saw that, that he was unworthy, that he was a murderer. He was born out of Caesar. He was persecuting the church. He had done all these bad things. But then God reached out in his love and picked him up and saved him. And then when he tried to explain that to the church at Ephesus, look what he says. He says, for by grace are you saved. By grace are you saved. You are saved by God's grace. You are not saved by your good works. You are doing good works because you are saved by grace. You are not doing the good works to get you into heaven. You are getting the good work because you know you're going to heaven. You've been saved by grace. And, and so the, the, the apostle here, in this, in this, these people here, these folks, wherever Paul went and preached, but you have to remember the church was really somewhat born or somewhat began to be lived out in a Jewish environment in like the fulfillment of the Mosaic law. And so the people who had been in that, the Pharisees and others, they kept on teaching that you had to obey the law to be saved. And Paul says, no, you're saved by grace, you know, you know by faith in the Lord. And this faith itself is a gift of God. So it's not something you worked up. The faith itself was a gift of God. And so they were him, and they was his greatest enemy. They are the ones who put Jesus Christ to death, and they are his greatest enemies here on earth. And so he's warning them. He's warning them. And these are teachers. These are false prophets. If you have your Bible, if you could turn in your Bible to, to, to uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 56, and he will describe these people's behavior these people's behavior. Let's look over there. And these are, these are people. And I'm going to make an application uh, to the us today. Uh, I want to warn us today. Yes, I think we've already been warned uh, of, of Islam going mad. I think we see that. We see radical Islam. We understand uh, uh, bin Laden. We understand that. We even begin a little understanding of how our own nation of Israel, a nation of Islam, 
in the black community, how that falls caught and make people sick. Uh, that might have a little bit to do with the sniper. Uh, he might be disillusioned. We can see the impact of false religion upon people and how, it, how deadly it can be. And so the Apostle Paul is making a, uh, uh, a warning here. And so I'm warning us. I'm warning us. And I'm going to tell you the, what I'm warning you about this morning. As we go, yes, Islam is, is uh, we got to love. The only way we're going to win them is not go and kill them all. That's not biblical. That's not biblical. Jesus tells us very plain and clear to love our enemy. If this world is going to be changed, it's going to be changed by love. Changed by love. I understand that. And so we got to reach out and love. We can't create such a hostile environment that we can't win those who have been deceived by these false religions. You understand? We got to still reach out after them and do what we can to win them. But let's look here in, as we describe these false teachers in Paul's day. Listen to what he says in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter chapter uh, 60, 56, beginning at verse 10. Uh, he says, his watchman, a watchman in the Old Testament was a prophet. The watchman in the Old Testament was the shepherd that was supposed to care for the sheep. And so instead of him caring for the sheep, this watchman was more concerned about himself, more concerned about his own prosperity. We're going to see that. Watchman, watchman. And that's where I'm getting to. I'm getting to this whole idea. Whatever thing we got to watch so careful that's going to milk up our resources, confuse our people, is this prosperity theology. I want you to see it. And it's deadly. It's so successful that everybody's afraid to confront it. Afraid to confront it. But it's milking off our resources. It's making them too personal. It's not in a collective action. We're asking God just to bless us. And when we want, we was called to be a blessing to the society. We were called to be a blessing to others, not just absorb the blessing, but to utilize God's blessing for the greater society, for the greater society. Listen at what he says. He said, his watchmen, his watchmen, they are blind. They are ignorant. They are dumb dogs. They cannot bark. They sleep lying down. They love to slumber. They are greedy dogs which can never have enough. Which can never have enough. You're never going to be rich enough. You're never going to be rich enough. You're never going to be prosperous enough. Can never have enough. Uh, uh, he said they can never have enough. Uh, uh, and they are shepherds that cannot understand you know, he said, yea, they are greedy dogs who cannot have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They are all looking to their own way. Everyone for his own gain and for his own quarters. Come ye, says they, I will fetch wine to you. I will give, give you all the good thing. I will fill yourself with strong drinks uh, and tomorrow shall be as today we're gonna enjoy ourselves I want you to know we're not gonna we're not gonna affect this drug culture unless when we do something about greed in our society we have a greed addiction in our society and drugs is an uh, intoxication that makes you think you have what you can't have. Drugs make you feel high. It makes, it fulfills what you can't have. And so you can have drugs. But it takes over your life. It takes over your life. And, 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 and the addiction is really, oh yes, the rich is addicted. Okay, I know that. Uh, the movie star is addicted, but I tell you, when I go to the jails, almost 90% of all of our prisoners 
are in jail in relationship to drugs. And when it comes to women, it's 95% of the women. And that's one of the highest growing, fastest growing population. There are two things happening in our society, a lot of things happening. But the one thing that's happening is the increase of women going to prison. Another thing is the increase of men killing women. It's an epidemic in our society. And of course, in my community, the black woman has been our survivor. And our survivor. She's taking care of our kids when we wouldn't work. She's taking care of our kids when we was in jail. She's taking care of our kids. And now we are playing cannibalism in my neighborhood in Jackson, where I live in our society. And all of it is because of greed. In Jackson, robbery is absolute. You, you have to have everything nailed down and locked up. And the people who are coming at it is these people who are addicted in our society. In our society. And unless we can confront consumism, unless we can confront greed, unless we can offer alternative way of living, that, that's, that's what the Mennonites used to be. It used to be an alternative way of living. It needed to be a lifestyle that did not need all of this exaggeration in order to do the will of God in our society. And so look what he says here. He said, come. He, uh, he said, today is going to be like tomorrow and much more abundant. Let me make the application to this and I'll be finished uh, this morning. The application I'm making today is what is getting me is this prosperity Christianity. Got our people serving God for what they can get. And they have organized this into a greedy science. And if you look at television, it almost completely controls the television market. And if you look at it as a program toward the black community, it is milking out our most intelligent, our most upward mobile people. It is giving them the promise. And it's also helping in my part of the country, it's helping to put fuel into the gambling market because they want to be prosperous and they're not that prosperous. And one of the best ways to be prosperous is to hit the lottery or to go to the boats and do gambling. And that's not even challenged. And the only way we're going to challenge it is by proclaiming uh, the word of God that we are doing here by us living an alternative lifestyle in society. There's got to be some Christian got to decide on enough is enough. And God's blessing, as he blessed me, I'm going to utilize that blessing to help others in the society. And that's what the church has been there doing. The church can continue to do that. The church can be people's last hope, but we want to make it more than that. We want to make it their first hope. We want them to come there and hope with us. Well, that was my warning. That's what Paul was doing. In the midst of this letter of joy, there, he gave him a warning. That's our warning. That's our warning. I don't know how we're going to do it. I think at some given time in our development, I think we need to have a, 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 what we always do at CCDA. When we get a big issue like this, we usually then, the board of directors used to talk about it. Then we would bring some other people together and have a, a think tank. And we'll have a little conference on it so that we can talk about how we can approach it. I think that we got to move to the place where we not only talk about the Christian faith, but we got to offer an alternative lifestyle. And we got to say to people, come and join with us. And let's have joy and fulfillment. Yes, our needs are going to be met because in the church, it says in the early church, uh, all the needs of the people were met. And the rest of the resources were used to further the gospel in the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for these wonderful people who come here and give their time to listen.
and to be a part of what we are doing. Now bless us, dear Jesus. Bless the rest of our service. And Lord, bless Gordon Mercer as he leads us in our association meeting. Lord, we just pray that a lot of people will participate in that so that they can be a part of what's going on in CCDA and that we can continue to reach out to these broken communities with a message of holism. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.